hey, I'm gonna drive the Leibniz integral rule for you where you can actually bring the derivative inside the integral. It's pretty cool. I'm gonna drive that using constant and non-constant limits of integration and it's gonna be awesome, so let's do it. Alrighty, so we're gonna start with our function and assume that it's continuously differentiable, the same as the limits right here on some region R of the xt plane. And the limits, they can be functions, but they can also be constant as well. And when we take the derivative here, notice that these are normal derivative d's, like single variable d's, not partial symbols. And that's because after we integrate, the x is gonna be gone and the integral of f is going to be a function of t only. So this is like a single variable derivative right here. Now to do the derivative, we're going to apply the limit definition of the derivative, which I have written right here. So if we apply this to the integral, thinking the integral as just a normal function, this is what we would have. So the limit is h goes to zero of one over h times the first function of t plus h, and the limits have to have t plus h in it as well, minus the second function, and then this would just be t right here. Okay, so from here, this is where things get tricky. The limits are different in these two terms, right? So we're gonna do something a little funky with the limits here. We're gonna change the limits by using the linearity of integrals. And some people may just talk to you about this. You might read it in a textbook, but I'm gonna show you a diagram that hopefully clarifies it really well. So we have our function of x and t right here, right? Now this could be t plus h, but anyways, just function of x and t. And our limits, are, we're to go from x of t plus h to b of t plus h. Here's our limits right here. And if we think of the integral as the area under the curve, this is like the area that we're, we're calculating right here. Now because of the linearity of integrals, we can determine this area a different way. We can first integrate from a of t plus h to a of t. And then we can go from a of t to b of t. And then from here, we can go from b of t to b of t plus h. And going from one, two, and three results in the same area, if we think of it as the area of, under the curve, as the limits here. Notice we, we're covering the area twice in this region, but one way is like a negative area, and the other way is like a positive area. So those cancel out exactly. And the net is this area right under here. So we're gonna do that. We're gonna break this term up into three terms, which is what I have right here. So this is where our integral is using the first set of limits, and then the second set of limits, and then the third set of limits right here, and then this last term is coming along for the ride. Okie dokie, so we have four terms to deal with. Now, at this point, this first term is kind of backwards, right? We usually like to have the t plus h on the top, and this is like a of t is usually like where we want to start. So we're going to flip this around, and we can do that. If you flip the limits, then we got to introduce a negative sign right here. And this second term and the fourth term, they have the same limits, right? So we're going to move the terms around it's the commutative rule so that those limits are together. So here we have the negative sign for this was this first term here. I flipped the limits, so the limits are flipped and we have the negative sign here. I just moved it here so I didn't have to deal with the negative out here. This second term, sorry, this third term is right here. And then the second and fourth term here, these have the same limits. I put them beside each other right here. Okay, from this point here, we're going to distribute the limit inside for each term, right? feed the chickens. And because this is big and long, we'll do a couple of things at once. We'll also merge these together. So you can think of it as factoring, but really it's like the integral sum difference rule in reverse. And if we do that, this is what we got right here. So we now have the limit as h goes to zero of one over h in front of each term. And these two terms we merged into one happy term by using the integral sum rule, sum difference rule. Really it's a difference here. Okay, now from here we have three terms to deal with. <laughs> We're getting there. So these first two terms are basically the same. There's a B here in the limits, and here it, there's an A. So these two terms are gonna be dealt with in the same way. This other one's a different beast on its own. So let's deal with this first one. So we're going to apply the mean value theorem for integrals. Now you may know what the mean value theorem is from Calc 1, but do you know how it applies to integrals? We have our function f of x, t, and we have our limits, b 
BT and B of T plus H right here. The mean value theorem for integrals tells us that for a continuous function over a closed interval, there exists some value C such that F of C represents the average value of the function. What does that mean? Well, if we think of integrals as areas under the curve, this green area here is going to be equal to this lined area mapped out by our average function. So they're equal to each other here. Now the green area is the area under the curve, so that's defined by our integral. And the lined area is defined by this rectangular shape. And its area is height times length. So the height of FC, that's the height of the rectangle. The length is B of T plus H minus B of T. So this area has to equal this area if F of C represents the average value of the function. Okay, so with our equation for the mean value theorem for integrals in hand, we're going to substitute this part in for f of x of t plus h, just for this first term here, so things don't look too messy. And that's what we got right here, just right into here. And at this point, we now have a limit of the product of two functions. So this first part is like one function, and then this f of c t plus h is like another function. So if we have the limit of two functions multiplied together, we can apply the limit law for products, the product of functions, and have the limit of each of those functions, just like that. So it's not like distributing it in, but it's like each function has its own limit right here, which is what we got. And if you look at this, the limit of this first function here, this is like the definition of the derivative, the limit as h goes to zero of our function plus h minus our function divided by h, that's it. So this part is literally the derivative of b, of our one limit, the limit b, with respect to t. To determine what happens to this limit, we need to apply the squeeze theorem. Now the squeeze theorem we learned in Calc 1 where the average value of the function has to be in between the value of the function at the two limits. So the average value of the function has to be greater than the value of the function at the lower limit and less than the value of the function at the upper limit. Now these may be reversed, it may be the other way around, but the average value of the function has to be in between the two limits. If we think of this in terms of as h goes to zero, this b of t plus h is going to b of t. So our function becomes the function at b of t. And if we think of this in terms of a number line, as t goes to zero, b of t plus h gets closer to b of t, so c becomes closer to b of t. And really, that's it, so that's our limit. So the limit as h goes to zero of the average value of our function, f of c, t plus h, it becomes f of b t comma t. So in applying the squeeze theorem to this limit, we got f of b t t, and this whole term here, this whole term becomes the derivative of b with respect to t times f of b t comma t. Oh. That's cool, so that's what this term is right here, and this term is exactly the same, except we're taking the derivative of a with respect to t. Nothing's changed except for the limits right here. So we got two terms done. Now for this last one, and to deal with this, we have the limit as h goes to zero of one over h. We're going to apply Lebesgue's dominated convergence theorem. Lebesgue's dominated convergence theorem allows us to bring the limit right inside the integral sign, no problem, most of the time. <laughs> now, this is a theory that warrants a deeper discussion, so to keep things short, I'm just gonna state the main conclusions. What we need is the function inside the integral sign that must converge pointwise as h goes to zero. This is what we have in our case. In other cases, we have a variable going to infinity, uh, but that's totally fine. Also, the function inside the integral this sequence of functions, because h can take on any value as we go to zero, it must be dominated by a function, pretty much any function that is integrable. So what that means is that at any given x, our dominated function must be greater than or equal to our sequence of functions here. And also our dominated function must have a finite integral as well. So applying Lebesgue's dominated convergence theorem to this term gives us this right here. We're essentially bringing the limit 
inside the integral sign. And this is a super key, critical, critical move in our derivation right here. Now that the limit is inside the integral, have a look at this. Yo, this is our definition of the derivative. So we can apply that directly. And this is now the derivative of f. Now these are partial derivatives because inside the integral, f is a function of both x and t, but this is what we have here. So now we've, we've simplified these three terms and we can now merge them together. So this equals the derivative of b with respect to t times f of b t t minus the derivative of a, our other limit with respect to t, f of a t t, and plus the integral of the derivative <laughs> uh, with respect to t of f of x t. And putting this all together, my friends, is the Leibniz rule in all its glory. But if we assume that the limits of integration are constant, then b doesn't change and a doesn't change with t. So that's both zero. So the derivative of our integral in all its glory <laughs> becomes the integral of the derivative uh, with respect to t right here. Cool. Now, you should definitely, definitely see how I use this rule to solve some pretty grueling, gruesome integrals. It's pretty sweet, the type of integrals that we can solve using this rule. It's pretty awesome. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.